here on the top right is a, a little dinosaur coach you can buy. I had a bit of debate over this. So who thinks you should buy your dog a little dinosaur coat? Okay, and who thinks that that is a complete waste of money and it's ridiculous? There we go. Well, there you go. Well, that trick you is with Kezia, who said it would be ultimately embarrassing to put a dog in a dinosaur cage. And then you're with me and Anita if you think actually it's absolutely brilliant and um, every dog should have a dinosaur cage. So, yeah, when we talk about self control, um, the kind of opposite end, um, we're doing seven um, helpful habits, but it's kind of come from seven deadly sins. And um, the kind of opposite when we look at self control is gluttony. And again, when we talk about gluttony, we kind of think about food, but it's not just about food, um, it's about having what we want right now to excess at the expense of others. So it's having what we want right now to excess at the expense of others. And C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia books, also a theologian in his own right, described it as the determination to get what we want, however troublesome it may be to others. And as I said, it's not just about food. Um, Overconsumption and conspicuous consumption um, often signal high kind of social or political or financial status in our society. And it's really interesting if you go into different cultures, if you only hang out in our church culture, you kind of have the kind of, you know, you know what people spend money on, you know what people don't spend money on. And then you go in a different culture, like you go into a different work culture, and actually it's completely different. Um, and it's deeply ingrained into our culture, this kind of consumption and this materialism. And often we don't notice it, unless we kind of go into a different culture and we kind of go, oh, we do that. Um, we don't notice it anymore. There's a um, there's a quote here, which is from the um, WWF International Director General. He says, we are living as if we have an extra planet at our disposal. We're using 50% more resources than the Earth can sustain, sustainably produce. And unless we change course, that number will grow fast. By 2030, even two planets will not be enough. And there's a picture underneath of the carbon footprint of what you eat and um, you know kind of how much carbon it takes, how much energy it takes to produce that, and therefore our environmental impact as a result. But as I said, it's not just food, it's things like fast fashion, it's valuing people in the um, in the fashion chain. Um, how many people actually made one of their dogs and sent it to the MP and got a response? I got a response. Um, I wanted, because it took a little while for the response, I wanted to um, send some dog food, because we have dog, we have dog food, some kibble in the post to my MP and say, I hope you're feeding him okay, while I was waiting for the response. But my, my kids said that might kind of cause a security crisis. So, um, so I did in the end, and I did get a response. But it is about valuing people in our supply chains and actually thinking about people. Um, the environmental impact, this one really challenged me when I found this stat. 75% of journeys made in cities are less than three miles. 75% of journeys made in cities are less than three miles. So often we drive when we could walk or we could cycle. And I hold my hands up. I am going into work in a central town on Tuesday and I'm cycling in because I don't want to pay for car parking. I will probably go to Woody's with my children tonight and I will drive because there is no car parking charges on a Sunday evening. And you know, the environmental consequences of those little decisions actually means that I am lowering the air quality for people in Bristol, often for people who don't have um, cars and who you know, um, aren't choosing that lifestyle, and also um, you know, increasing the environmental footprint. We also fly because it's economically incentivized to do so. Um, you know, despite the alternatives, it's often cheaper to fly to Glasgow or to Edinburgh, or sometimes even Leeds and Manchester. Um, you know, despite the consequences on the planet. And it's interesting when you talk about gluttony and self-control, and I'm going to talk about three main things, our relationship with um, God, our relationship with ourselves, and our relationship with um, others and the planet. And it's not a judgmental list of what you should do and what you shouldn't do, what our culture says you should do, and comparing that, but it's a wake-up call and a, um, and a responsibility an individual responsibility about how we um, improve our self-control and what's driving that relationship with stuff which we have in our lives. 
So the first one is um, getting right to our relationship with God. So when you're in relationship with somebody, you want to please them. And when you hang out with somebody, you become more like them. I don't know if you have ever communicated with somebody by email for quite a while before you've met them. And um, sometimes, um, you know, especially in a kind of office environment, some of these emails you get feel a little bit officious, they feel a little bit formal. You're kind of saying, I want to achieve this, can I go through this route? They're saying, no, you need to do the proper procedural route. And then you go to like an away day or something and you meet this person and they're lovely and you have this great relationship and then it kind of extends into the, you know, your kind of email conversation later. And that's a bit like our relationship with God. We need to get right our relationship with God because if we get right our relationship with God, then it impacts the rest of the relationships around us. We hang out with God more, we become more like him. And Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit, so the fruit of the Spirit is, um, you know, you have an apple tree, it produces apples, um, you know, it's the fruit of hanging out with God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if you... This, this isn't particularly about food, but we do talk about food in it in terms of kind of self-control. But if you struggle with your um, relationship with food or with addiction or with overconsumption, um, the first point I wanted to make about getting right to our relationship with God is that God doesn't invite us into a set of rules. God invites us into relationship and to come and eat with him. Which is why I've got this picture here of um, this fire and the people sitting around the fire. If you look at Jesus, the Bible is full of stories of Jesus eating with people. So from tax collectors and sinners and, you know, all sorts of people, people didn't want to hang around with, you know, <coughs> eating with his disciples and having his really significant conversations, you know, not in a kind of lecture, um, you know, although he did sermons to, to masses of people like the Sermon on the Mount, but kind of those intimate conversations you get with eating. And Jesus invites us to eat with him. He invites us to, to be part of the meal. So this is um, from John 21. And this is the story at the end of John where Jesus has been crucified and he's resurrected from the dead. So what happens is Peter was a follower of Jesus for three years. You know, him and Jesus were like, you know, best mates, did everything together. And then at the end, he denied Jesus three times. He said, I don't know who this guy is. He massively mucked up. You know, he didn't do it once, he did it three times. And it says, you know, the, the cock crowed. You know, it's, Jesus said, you're going to deny me. He said, I'm not going to deny you. Um, and so then we've got this little story where Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. There was Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathan, the sons of Zebedee, and the other disciples were out together. And Simon Peter said, I'm going to go and fish. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got in the boat, but they caught nothing. I don't know if anyone fishes, that seems fairly familiar. Um, you know, you go out, you catch nothing. Um, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore and his disciples didn't realise it was Jesus. So there's a figure standing on the, on the shore. And he called out to them and he said, friends, have you got any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple, who Jesus loved, said to Peter, it's the Lord, it's Jesus, that's who it is. And as soon as Simon Peter heard that, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for it taken off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. And Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore, and it was full of large fish. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask them who it was, because they knew it was the Lord. He took the bread and he gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. So they were out there, and he didn't say, okay, you, 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 but not you, come and have breakfast. I don't know if anyone has ever had the misfortune of having a child in reception year at school when the party invitations are giving out. 
And you know, it's like some people get party invitations and some people don't. And there's always a lot of upsetness about who doesn't get party invitations. And that wasn't what Jesus was like. He included everybody. And he included Peter, who was massively messed up. And he then went on and had a conversation with Peter, you know, and he said, um, you know, do you love me? He said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He reinstated Peter. He said, you're really important. And that's really my kind of first point about getting right our relationship with God, is that we are invited to have dinner with God. We're invited to eat with God. We're invited to the party. When we have communion every month or so, um, when we have communion, that's us being invited to God's table to come and take part in, um, in the breaking of bread, in, in his resurrection. And we are all welcome for that. And there's another story. There's a story on the road to Emmaus where the disciples are confused and they're depressed and they're like, you know, what's happened? You know, we had this, um, we're meant to have this kind of amazing thing and kind of, you know, Jesus has died and we don't understand what's happened. And Jesus talks to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and then he eats with them and their eyes are opened and they realise it was Jesus and they were like, actually, he's been explaining all the scriptures to us and, and now we understand. So whoever you are, whether you've messed up or whether you're confused and cynical and depressed and downcast, God invites you to eat. He invites you to share in his goodness. I do like this icon. It's very good. Um, so the second one is about getting right our relationship with others and the planet. So I really believe it's when we are loved that we can love other people. And when we're secure, we can embrace and we can reach out. When we have that overflow, then we can reach out and we can show that love to others. And if we value ourselves above others, or we don't believe there's enough to go around, then that's when it breaks relationships. And that's when we have this whole kind of judgment coming in of kind of, you know, well, you do this and I do that. And it pits one person against each other. Now, this is a rhetorical question, but who bought toilet roll they didn't need at the beginning of COVID because they were worried it was going to roll out? Who was actually down to their last roll before they bought toilet roll? But what happened, well, Tom was, okay. Um, but actually what happened was, um, you know, for most people there was this kind of scarcity mentality where there was always a run on the shops for toilet roll and because everybody was going to take the toilet roll, we all needed to go out and to buy some toilet roll. I don't think I've ever discussed buying toilet roll in a work context apart from at the beginning of COVID. Um, and it was about getting it in case it wasn't there for tomorrow. And sometimes that's where this kind of greed and this kind of gluttony comes from. It comes from this idea of scarcity. It comes from this idea that there isn't enough, and so we, see, we need to see it now. But the really great thing is that God is not a God of scarcity. He's a God of abundance, and he's a God who provides for us yesterday and today and forever. And to have a healthy relationship with food and with stuff, we need to be interconnected, and we need to believe that God will provide for us tomorrow as well as today. And the Bible talks about feasting, it talks about celebrating in community as well as fasting, and where we join together, we collectively pray, we collectively mourn. And fasting is really helpful in helping us reset our relationship with stuff. If we think that we are over-consuming, if we think that we are addicted to certain stuff, then actually it helps us reset things in our proper place. You know, if you say, I'm not going to accept any deliveries from Amazon for the next 12 months, you know, do I really need that tomorrow? Um, you know, do I really need it in the next two hours? It's kind of quicker and quicker, um, you know, these delivery deadlines. You know, do I need to um, update my social media as often as I do? Um, and also, when we fast food, it helps connect us with the hungry. And it reminds us to pray. If you're hungry, it just reminds you to pray. And it also reminds us that only God can fix those problems. You know, we are not the one who is fixing that problem. That's why we're crying out to God. And it reminds us that God will provide. Then my third point is about um, getting right to our relationship with ourselves. And sometimes this is really hard to kind of, you know, value ourselves. Um, but how does God see you? And God sees you not what you look like and whether you've been to the gym this week and what you wear. And you know, God doesn't see you as a failure. He doesn't love you anymore if you eat the cookies in a jar or if you don't eat the cookies. 
You know, if you meet your target weight or if your blood sugar is perfect, but actually he just loves you. And that's what we really need to accept. Some of the songs we sang this morning were really helpful in kind of, you know, singing those affirmative words about, you know, how much God loves us and us loving God back. And eating in my house, um, you know, it's not something which we do and then we've done it and we don't have to do it again. It's a bit like cleaning, it feels like it's ongoing. Um, you know, I, I can clear up from breakfast and, you know, about 28 minutes later, the kids will go, what's for lunch? And I'm like, I'm just tired enough from breakfast. Um, and, and I think, you know, actually, the fact that we have these rhythms of eating, we have these, um, you know, kind of, it reminds us that we are, um, we are human, that we came from dust, but yet God cares for us and that God feeds us and God provides us. And it's a bit like prayer. You know, when we eat in our house, we say grace. Um, you know, if we have these daily rhythms which we get into, then it helps us to set right relationships with ourselves and helps us to connect with God. Um, in Matthew 6, it says, Do not worry about your life, what you eat or what you wear, because look at the birds of the air. Life is more important than food, and the body is more important than clothes. They do not reap, but yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And we need to value ourselves and we need to understand ourselves so that actually when we are feeling empty, we're not filling that with more stuff. We're not filling that with going out and shopping and you know buying a new black top and actually we've got those at home or social media or gambling or alcohol. But actually we're setting up a rhythm and putting boundaries in place. And there's a really good Bible study, which anyone, if anyone's interested, I can send you the link to. Um, which Eugene Peterson did. He, um, he's a writer, he wrote the message. And it's called Godspeed, and it's about slowing down and walking with God. Um, so when Jesus walked on earth, he walked at about three miles an hour. And there was so much pain and so much poverty and so much stuff he could have done in Israel, but he walked at three miles an hour and he walked slowly. Um, and when you start walking slowly, you start to notice the people around you, you start to notice the environment around you. A couple of weeks ago, Tim and I went to um, Linton and Limmer, and oh my goodness, those hills are steep. Like, it's brutal. And um, you know, going out on Exmoor, and um, we got very lost, and I got stuck in the bog, and I had a little bit of strop. But, you know, you're kind of out there, and you know the only way you're going to get back from that moor, where you kind of realise you're like about two kilometres off the map from where you thought you were, and you're not actually on the path, you're on the street. Um, is by walking and putting one foot in front of another. And when we get right our relationship ourselves, it's not easy. Sometimes it's just focusing on putting one foot in front of another. But actually, it's about slowing down and forming habits and being more mindful of the impact we're having on ourselves by our behaviour and on others. Is it loving other people and the environment? And it's really interesting to talk on self-control because I, I've kind of wavered massively, massively in terms of kind of how to do it because you've kind of got self-control and you've got gluttony and you've got food and our relationship to food is really complicated and, and actually the one thing which I've kind of really come back to is it's not about self-control, it's about self-surrender. And in getting our relationships right with God, in getting our relationships right with other people and the planet, and in getting our relationships right with ourselves, it's about surrendering. And I was recently reading um, Daniel Strickland's book, which Marion recommended to me, called The Other Side of Hope. And at the end, she talks about prayer. And she talks about prayer loads of times, and I'm sure many of you have come across this. Um, but she talks about these three positions. She talks about surrender, and then generosity, and then mission. And I think this is so important because if you surrender, then you are laying down what you need, what you want, and you're saying, God, I trust you in this. I trust that you are the God of yesterday, today, and forever, and I surrender to you. And if you surrender, then you're believing that God can provide, and therefore you can be generous in whatever way that is. And if you can be generous, then you can look up and you can look at the world around you and you can look at that mission. And it's something I've really been challenged with because, um, you know, my eldest daughter is about, well, she's coming up to 18 now. And, you know, when she was little, we did a dedication service. 
and you know you dedicate your child to God and you say, God, I trust you with my child. And then as a parent, there are many, many times over the next 18 years where you go, God, I trust you with my child, and I trust you with my child. You know, and we're going back into um, you know, this year we've got A levels so we've got GCSE, so but you know, I'm not I'm not massively looking forward to this year. And it's me going, God, I trust you with my child. And if I trust God with my children, then it means I have more energy to look out for other people's children because I'm not so focused on my own children. Um, and I found that really helpful when we think it's not it's not about self-control, it's not about what I can control. Um, you know, obviously making sure they get their homework done and that sort of stuff is, is quite helpful. Um, but actually it's about surrendering to God and going, whatever the outcome is, God, you are in charge and you are in control and you love my kids and you have um, a good future for them. So I'm going to end there, which is very short, I'm sorry. Um, it's the end of the summer series. Um, but um, yeah, I, I hope that leaves you with a challenge and I'll just pray as, um, as I end. Father God, I thank you for this topic, God. I thank you that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control, God. That is something which we can develop by hanging out with you, by our relationship with you. And God, I thank you that it's something where we can rely on you and we can surrender to you, God, in whatever aspect of our, our lives, God, that we are struggling with. Father, I thank you that you are a God who is good, God, a God who invites us to eat at your table, God, a God who doesn't reject any of us, who doesn't compare us, but invites us into your family. And Father God, I just pray that you would be with us, God, as we wrestle with some of these things, God, as we wrestle with the consumption of our world, God, as we wrestle with our own habits which aren't helpful. Father, I just pray that you would help us to surrender to you, God, and to know your peace, that you are with us in these situations, and that you guide us and that you're for us. And God, to trust you, God, that you are the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that we can trust you because you are the God who is our provider.